Alright, hello and welcome fellow users of the internet. My name is Noah and you're watching Asphodel Merchants. Alright, hopefully you've been watching this series along so far and know that it's time for the Wilds of Eldraine limited tier list in white. So let's go ahead and scroll in and get our images bigger to where I like to read them. And we're going to start off with our first card, Archon of the Wild Rose. Two colorless and white white for a creature. It's an Archon. It's a 4-4 with flying. And other creatures you control that are enchanted by auras you control have base power and toughness 4-4 four, four, and have flying. A plus. Right off the bat. I think it's pretty good. I'm really excited for this card. I mean, 4 mana 4-4 four, four flying is already really good stats. And uh, the roll token should make it pretty easy to be putting auras that you control on your creatures and help you getting in for a lot of extra power in the air. A plus for Archon. You open it, put in your deck. Number two is Archon's Glory. It's one white for an instant. It's got bargain. You can sacrifice an artifact, enchantment, or token you control to cast a spell. Dark creature gets plus two, plus two until end of turn. If this spell was bargained, that creature also gains flying and lifelink until end of turn. Okay. So, Archon's Glory, I think, is going to operate at about a C level. We've seen this kind of effect before. Plus two, plus two for one white isn't a lot. If you do get to bargain it, though, flying and lifelink is pretty good. But then uh, the flying aspect of these spells make you want to do them pre-combat. That way they're not blocked. And it does help out a lot of the time. But normally you want your combat trick to act, to act as a pseudo-removal spell to kill your opponent's card. Not just uh, get your damage through. But that's where we're going to have it for right now. All right, next up we have Armory Mice. Callless and a white for a creature. It's a mouse, and it's a 3-1. It's got the celebration mechanic. Armory Mice gets plus 0, plus 2, as long as two or more non-land permanents entered the battlefield under your control this turn. This card is probably okay-ish. Uh, as I've talked before, one toughness creatures are an additional liability, considering all the ways there are to remove them in this format and the other colors at this moment in time I'm gonna give armory mice a D but I could see it being a little bit more valuable of a card that you'll wanna make sure to make your white decks because when it does attack uh, as a 3-3 it's gonna feel pretty good but any other time I think it's gonna be pretty middling next up we have Bisoted Knight three colorless and a white for a creature human knight it's a 3-3 we playing with hill giants in 2023 not quite, because it's also got Betrothed the Beast, which is an adventure. It's a sorcery. Create a royal roll token attached to target creature you control. Enchanted creature gets plus one, plus one, and has ward one. You are no monster to me, my love. Um, I think this is another D. Um, I feel like, you know, neither of the halves of this adventure, like, if you get to play both of these, you don't really feel like you get paid off. Of course, the more and more you need these rolls, maybe just having access to one of them is a lot, but I'm not even sure a royal roll token is worth one colored mana. Alright, next up we have Break the Spell. One white for an instant. Detro destroy target enchantment. If a permanent you controlled or a token was destroyed this way, draw a card. I almost want to give this... No, wait a minute. I think I will put this in B for Break the Spell. This card, I think, is just really going to overperform because you destroy your own uh, curse tokens and whatnot. Um, being able to destroy your opponent's rolls to draw a card is pretty good. It's not so much would you pay one mana to destroy one of your own enchantments or one of your opponent's roll tokens. It's do you want to pay one white and jump through a very large hoop. I said a small hoop, but it's easier to jump through a large hoop. Yeah, well, you know, perform a very easy task and pay one white man to get to draw a card, and I think the answer is yes. B for this card. All right, next up we've got Charmed Clothier. Four colorless and a white for a creature. Fairy Advisor with flying. It's a 3-3. Three, three. And when it enters the battlefield, create a royal roll token attached to another target creature you control. This is a C 
for Charlotte Clothier. It is a very powerful C. A lot of the time, this card will just be enough to win you the game, but three toughness does still die. It doesn't get to enchant itself, and if you don't control another creature whenever you top deck this and play it, you just don't get the roll token. So that's just a C for Charm Clothier. Next up, we have Cheeky House Mouse. One white for a creature. It's a mouse. It's a 2-1. Um... Yeah, got it. Savannah Lions, anyone? But yeah, it's also got an adventure. Squeak by. Uh, one white for a sorcery adventure. Target creature you control gets plus one, plus one until next turn. It can't be blocked by creatures with power three or greater this turn. Hmm. I think I'm also going to give this card a C. I could see it performing a little bit better than that. Maybe time will tell. But uh, it is reasonably aggressive. Both of them are very reasonably aggressive. Um, I could see this performing at a B level, but for right now, I'm just going to leave it in C. All right. Next up, we have Cooped Up. I got a lot of things to say about this little enchantment. One colorless and a white for an enchantment aura. It has enchant creature. Enchanted creature can't attack or block, and then it has an activated ability. Two colorless and a white. Exile enchanted creature. This is an A for sure, and the reason... Hear me out, folks. You can activate the ability of Cooped Up and hold priority, and with the ability on the stack, before the creature is exiled, you can cast an instant with Bargain and sacrifice Cooped Up to the Bargain ability. And I know this because I used to play with a card called Dreadful Apathy back in Theros Beyond Death Limited, and you can read this ruling right here. If Dreadful Apathy leaves the battlefield while it's a last ability is on the stack the permanent that's exiled is the one dreadful apathy enchanted before leaving the battlefield even if that permanent is no longer a creature so yeah this card's mega good uh gives your other things extra value and exiles your creature a for cooped up next up we have cursed courier two colorless and a white for a creature it's a human noble and it's a three three it's got lifelink however it, when Cursed Courier enters the battlefield, create a Curse Roll token attached to it. Enchanted Creature is a 1-1. One, one. So it's 3 mana for a 1-1 one, one lifelink. And, of course, the joke is, is that you actually want extra roll tokens to get to sacrifice to your bargain creatures. And uh, you want to be able to destroy yourself and yada yada. I am right now going to give Cursed Courier a D. It could end up playing a little bit better. But I'm not sure about that right now. Um, it will... Maybe I would give this more of a build-around B grade. Like, it will play like a B if you can somehow get it to where you play this on turn 3 and with 1 mana up, uh, either bargain it or destroy the roll and do it like that. But if you're not doing those things pretty immediately, this card's going to be somewhat of a liability. All right, next up we have Discerning Financier. Two colorless and a white for a creature, a human noble. It's a 2-3. At the beginning of your upkeep, if an opponent controls more lands than you, create a treasure token. And then it's got two, and a, two colorless and a white. Choose another player. That player gains control of target. Treasure you control, draw a card. Hmm. The problem is I don't... There's no real reliable way to know that your opponent's going to have more lands than you, so you're not getting treasures. So you need other treasure makers for discerning financier to even do anything. But there are other ways to make treasures in this format, so knowing how many treasures you need should help. Hmm. Am I going to give this a D? I might. I'm not sure if I'm that soul on this card anymore. It's still a 2 minute 2 3. But if your opponent does control the more land than you, it does help you not stay behind in the mana fight. How many ways are there to make treasures in white? Let me just look right fast over here. No. Uh, treasure, 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 treasure. Um, not many. You might have to have another color. To help you out in this, this might secretly be a gold card. Yeah, I didn't see another way to make a treasure in white. I think I'm actually going to give this card a D. I mean, it could perform 
at a B level in all honesty if you are in a color that's helping you make treasures probably in red white or in black white yeah I'm not seeing anything over here on my other screen full of stuff yeah if, if it's if it gets to be in red I think uh, this card will do a lot better but without it I think it's just a D maybe it helps you with your mana disadvantage maybe it doesn't Alright, next up we have Dutiful Griffin. Three colorless and white white for a creature. It's a griffin, it's a 4-4, and it has flying. But it also has two colorless and a white, sacrifice two enchantments you control, return Dutiful Griffin from your graveyard to your hand. This card's a B, it's super good. Uh, it might even trend towards A, but three mana is enough, and maybe not all the time you want your enchantments to go away. And to your hand, it's still kind of clunky, but I think this card's pretty good. Alright, next up we have Eerie Interference. Two colorless and a white for an instant. Prevent all damage that would be dealt to you and creatures you control this turn by creatures. Okay, so... Funny thing is I think this card is going to play a little bit better than it might look. A three mana fog effect probably isn't very good, but it prevents all the damage to your creatures. So you get to make all the blocks you would want to make, and then this card... And then your creature will live and your opponent's creatures will still die. And then you won't take any damage. You can also use this card aggressively because it prevents the damage to your creatures. And so you can just swing out and attack. They make their blocks. Cast this, protect all your creatures. And then all of your other things will still survive. And then all of your other things will still deal their damage. So, can help you press the attack. Can help keep you alive. I'm going to give a C to Eerie Interference. I think it does help that I remember a card like this. I think that was in Ikoria that I played that was normally pretty good. All right, next up we have Expel the Interlopers. Three colorless and white white for a sorcery. Choose a number between zero and ten. Destroy all creatures with power greater than or equal to the chosen number. Worst comes to worst, this is five mana Wrath of God. It's an A plus. Uh, especially if you ever can save one or two of your own creatures. And so just with all that, I mean, it's an A+. Plus. If you get Expel the Interlopers, you're going to want to have it in your deck. All right, next up we have Frost Bridge Guard. One colorless and a white for a creature elemental soldier. It's a 2-2, and it has two colorless and a white. Tap it and tap target creature. You know, played me some Nomad Convoy, I think it was, in Dominary Master, and that was a 3-mana... Three capper. I don't think uh, that's going to be good enough in this modern limited. Even with the cross tapping formats, it's going to be a lot of mana. And it's going to feel pretty clunky. I'm going to put it in D right now. I could almost talk myself into putting this in F. I'm not sure this is the creature you want to have access to. All right, next up we have Gallant Pie Wielder. Two colors and a white for a creature. Dwarf Knight. It's a 2 3 with first strike. And it's got Celebration. Gallant Pie Wielder has Double Strike as long as two or more non-land permanents enter the battlefield under your control this turn. Um, I think I might actually go ahead and give this a B. Double Strike's a pretty powerful effect. Uh, two mana for a 2-3 First Strike is actually pretty decent stats. And if you're ever to put one of the roll tokens on this, the monster roll in particular that gives Trample, it's going to be pretty impressive. Alright, next up we have Glass Casket. Colorless and a white for an artifact. When Glass Casket enters the battlefield, exile target creature and opponent controls with mana value 3 or less until Glass Casket leaves the battlefield. This card's pretty good. You are going to want to be able to deal with your opponent's smaller stuff, but since it doesn't deal with bigger stuff, you're not going to want like infinite copies of this spell, so I'm just going to leave a C on Glass Casket. Next up, we got what I think is a special one. We've got Hopeful Vigil. Colorless and a white for an enchantment. When Hopeful Vigil enters the battlefield, create a 2 2 white knight creature token with vigilance. When Hopeful Vigil is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, scry two and two colorless and a white sacrifice Hopeful Vigil. This card is awesome. I'm giving it a B. I could almost probably be talked into giving it an A, but not quite. All right, next up we have Kellen's Light Blades. One colorless and a white for an instant. B 
and it's got bargain. You may sacrifice an artifact enchantment or token as you cast a spell. Kellen's Light Bait deals three damage to target attacking or blocking creature. If this spell was bargained, destroy that creature instead. This card, I am going to go ahead and give an A2 because being able to spend two mana and get rid of one of your hopefully not very much mana, one of these pieces of bargain material to destroy a creature is a pretty good deal. It's any creature, helps keep you alive. A for Kellen's Light Blades. Alright, next up we have Knight of Doves. Two colorless and a white for a creature, human knight. Whenever an enchantment you control is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, create a 1 1 white bird creature token. This is kind of a build around. Hmm, you want to get this build around A, because yeah, if you were to somehow get like two birds off of this, you would be in a pretty controlling position for that game. Hmm. I don't think it's quite me. You do have to do... That is a certain amount of a hoop to jump through. If if you have enough enchantments that you are successfully getting on, into your graveyard on the successive turns, then it could perform as an A, but for right now I'm going to leave it in B. Alright, next up we have Moment of Valor. Two colorless and a white for an instant. Choose one untapped target creature. It gets plus one plus one and gains indestructible until end of turn. Or destroy target creature with power four or greater. At this moment in time, I think I'm going to give this card a D. Um, if you don't have any creatures, the first ability is not important, and there are definitely going to be enough games where you don't quite have any creatures, and your opponent is just beating you down with all three power or lesses, and this card's just really not going to do anything. Uh, for that reason, I'm going to give it a D. But it is possible that in a certain texture of games, it's going to perform a lot better. And uh, in draft, make sure to maybe pick up a copy for your sideboard. And also in sealed, remember that this card is in your pool in case your opponent does play a couple of really powerful beaters. All right. Next up, we have Moon Shaker Cavalry. Five colorless, white, white, white. For a creature, it's a spirit knight, and it's a 6-6. Six, six. It has flying. And when Moonshaker Cavalry enters the battlefield, creatures you control gain flying and get plus X plus X until end of turn, where X is the number of creatures you control. Okay. Normally I complain a lot about 8 mana spells, but this is an 8 mana spell that can pretty much win the game. You know, on its floor, you don't really want to play 8 mana for a 6-6 six, six flyer, but you really don't have to have that many creatures before the ability becomes very, very scary. This card, when you cast it, if you just have four 1-1s one -ones on the field, just like four 1-1 one -one rats, the most innocuous creatures or tokens you can ask for, this card will then make those each um, six sixes. They'll each get plus five, plus five, and then you'll attack for 24, and that just wins the game. So the fact that it does have the upside of very possibly winning the game pretty much any on the turn you cast it, as long as you can keep a board, I'm going to give a tentative build around A to Moonshaker Cavalry, uh, you, this is a card you're going to have to prepare for, a card you're going to have to play for in anticipation of getting this. So, it could definitely perform a little bit worse, but the power level is certainly there. A for Moon Shaker Cavalry. Alright, next up we've got Plunge into Winter. One colorless and a white for an instant. Tap up to one target creature, scry one, then draw a card. Okay, so we just played with Hithlane Knots in Lords of the Rings Limited. That was one colorless and a blue for this exact same event it effect at instant speed. This card um, is going to work with the cross tapping synergy. Uh, tapping your opponent's creatures is the blue white shtick. And I think this card is going to be a super over performer. I'm going to put it in B and I could even see it performing as an A. Uh, I just assume this card is going to be a real over performer and I'm probably never going to cut a copy from any of my white decks. All right next up we have the princess takes flight. Two colorless and a white for a saga. Chapter 1, exile up to one target creature. Chapter 2, target creature you control gets plus 2, plus 2, and gains flying until end of turn. And Chapter 3, return the exile card to the battlefield under its owner's control. So it is kind of a temporary lockdown. Temporary, temporary lockdown. That's funny. For uh, a creature, your opponent, or you could perhaps exile one of your own creatures to uh, get a an additional ETB trigger, or perhaps a leave the battlefield trigger. And it does 
help you get in some damage. Because also you can bargain these sagas, I'm going to give this card a B. I do think it's going to be a reasonably powerful addition. All right, next up we have Protective Parents, two colorless and a white for a creature. It's a human peasant. It's a 3-2. When Protective Parent dies, create a young hero roll token attached to up to one target creature you control. This is a C. I think you're going to be happy enough having a 3 mana 3 2 dies leave behind something, but uh, not much more than that. Alright, next up we have Regal Bunicorn. Colorless and a white for a creature, rabbit, unicorn. Regal Bunicorn power and toughness are equal to. To the number of non-land permanents you control. I, it's really weird because we talk a lot of the time how in Constructed anyway, almost no amounts of raw stats is enough to make a creature good. It has to do a lot of other things. In Limited, perhaps, some amount of raw stats are all a creature needs. But something about this card is telling me it might, might just be a little bit too good to be true. I think you're thinking about the games where you've just got a bunch of dirtily stuff and it's just this 2 minute 8-8 eight, eight, and your opponent can never deal with it. There are going to be plenty of times you play it where it might just be a 2-2 two, two, and it dies to your opponent's common removal spell for nothing and it's not even going to outperform their best common. All of those be things being considered, I think to avoid possibly eating a bit of crow, I have to put it in A because I'm sure it's going to do just well enough in every white deck it gets put in, especially since it only costs two mana. And despite my own fears, which are probably unfounded, this card's still going to perform like an A. So, A for Regal Monocorn. All right, next up we have Return Triumphant. One colorless and a white for a sorcery. Return target creature with mana value three or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. Create a young hero roll token attached to it. Enchanted creature uh, has whenever this creature attacks. If toughness three or less, put a plus one plus one counter on it. If you put another roll on the creature later, put this roll into the graveyard. I think I'm only. I think I'm going to add this to our D slot. Mostly because it's very possible if you return a three drop or even certain two drops, they can already have three toughness, so your roll token will essentially have no value, and it's very possible that it's not going to even make it that much bigger, or at certain times in the game, just returning a three drop isn't really going to do that much. Um, I think we've seen cards similar to this. I think there was a recommission in Brothers War, and that card was not that impressive in the limited format. So, D for this spell. All right, next up we have Rhyme for a Reindeer. Three colors and a white for a creature. It's an elk, and it's a 3-4. And whenever an enchantment enters the battlefield under your control, tap target creature and opponent controls. This card is pretty good. I think... Mm, I don't think it's going to quite be a B, but it could be. Right now I'm going to put it in the higher end of C pretty powerful, but it's, it really will depend on your total enchantment count, your total ability to make those, and then how overall aggressive it is. Um, do keep in mind that if you can flash in an enchantment, by the way, it can tap a creature on your opponent's turn, but I don't know how much that's actually going to come up. Alright, we'll give top C for Rhyme for Reindeer. Next up, we have Savior of the Sleeping. Two colors and a white for a creature. Human Knight, it's a 2-3, and it has Vigilance. And whenever an enchantment you control is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, put a plus one, plus one counter on Savior of the Sleeping. This one is also a C, but a much worse C. You can almost see it trending lower, but it should grow decently enough. And if you get this up to a 4-5, you should be very happy with it. Alright, next up, we have Slumbering Keep Guard. And it is one white for a creature. It's a human knight. It's a 1-1. One, one. And whenever an enchantment enters the battlefield under your control, scry one. And it has two colorless and a white slumbering keep guard. Gets plus one, plus one until end of turn for each enchantment you control. That ability is really not that impressive. And I'm not sure how much, how many scries you're really going to get off this thing. As of, But it is one colorless. 
It only really helps, though, if your deck's being mega aggressive. As of right now, I think I'm going to put this in the top of D, but I could uh, accept that I'm wrong enough about this card. We'll have to see how it goes. Alright, next up is Solitary Sanctuary. We have two colorless and a white for an enchantment. When Solitary Sanctuary enters the battlefield, tap target creature and opponent controls, and put a stun counter on it. Whenever you tap an untapped creature and opponent controls, put a plus one plus one counter on target creature you control. This card is an A. It is really, really good. It is a payoff for all the other tap creatures that I've been talking about. Really a signpost uncommon that uh, is going to really make any of your white decks super powerful. Enabler and payoff, by the way, since you will get a plus one, plus one counter off of stunning the creature off of Solitary Confinement's ETB. Alright, next up we have Spellbook Vendor. Colorless and a white for a creature, human peasant with vigilance, and at the beginning of combat on your turn, you may pay one when you do create a sorcerer roll token attached to target creature you control. If you control another roll, put that in the graveyard. The, this is the uh, plus one, plus one, and when this creature attacks, scry one. I actually think this card's an A+. Plus. So, the reason being is you basically only ever play this on turn three, and you turn your two drop that you played before it into a more... Sorry. You put the two drop that you played before this the sorcerer roll onto it, making it more powerful, then you can always put a roll token onto this, or whatever you play next, and so on and so forth, and I do think that this is just, you know, going to over time buff up your whole team and make it very powerful. I think this is going to be one of the better cards for the white aggressive deck, and isn't going to do too bad in any of the other white strategies. A plus for Spellbook Vendor. Alright, next up we have Stockpiling Celebrant. Two colorless and a white for a creature, it's a Dwarf Knight, it's a 3-2, and when Stockpiling Celebrant enters the battlefield, you may return another target non-land permanent you control to its owner's hand if you do Scry 2. I think this card's going to be really powerful. I'm going to go ahead and give it a B, because if you were to bounce back any of your Sagas, or Hopeful Vigil, or something that's being held down by an opponent's aura, or an opponent's curse roll, it's going to really just throttle your advantage a lot. And so, I'm going to give a B for Stock High and Suffering. Alright, next up we have The Stroke of Midnight. Two colorless and a white for an instant. Destroy target non-land permanent. Its controller creates a plus one, creates a one one white human creature token. And this card is also an A. It is, it literally deals with any problem and your opponent only gets a one one back for it. It's not much uh, compensation. Really good card. Always take it, Stroke of Midnight. Alright, next up we have a Tale for the Ages. One colorless and a white for an enchantment. Enchanted creatures you control get plus two, plus two. Um, in all honesty, this card probably is going to be really good. You know, if somehow you don't make a single roll token in your limited deck, yeah, the card's going to be really, really bad. But I also think there's no way you're going to, like, you'd almost have to try to dodge all of those cards. So I, even though I do think this card's silly, I do think I'm going to give it an A+, plus, since it should always work. All you have to do is find cards that say rolls, or take one of the few auras, and your cards should be really good. Make all of your cards really good. Put them all on there. Yeah, A+, plus for a Tales Age. Too many A's to not be an A. Alright, next up we have the three blind mice. Two colorless and a white. For a saga, chapter one, create a 1 1 white mouse creature token, not to be confused with 1 1 rat. And then chapters two and three is create a token that's a copy of tar token you control. And then chapter four is creatures you control get plus one plus one and gain vigilance until end of turn. Hmm. I'm actually, okay, like originally I thought this card was okay because, like, it, it kind of reads like you get. Three, the three mice, and then everything gets plus one, plus one, and vigilance. But if they kill the first mouse, you don't necessarily have anything to copy. But you do have the upside of, if you have a better token, you can copy it, like any of the night tokens or something else. I think I'm going to put it in B for right now. It's a very powerful card, but it does have minor amount of risk. Not a ton, but enough. 
and it also has uh, the can be bargain part. So yeah, we're gonna go ahead and give B for blind mice. I can see it performing a little bit better and maybe even a little worse. All right, next up we have Tundale Guide. Three colorless and a white for a creature. It's a fairy scout. It's a 2 3 with flying and it has celebration. Tundale Guide gets plus one plus zero and has lifelink as long as two or more non land permanents enter the battlefield under your control this turn. <laughs> okay, I think this is. Probably our other best C. I'm actually going to put it above Rhyme for Reindeer. Not that this is exactly ordered, but it is ordered when I think about it. And I do think Toonvale Guy could almost be a B. But the more I look at it, it's not quite on the power level of some of our other B cards. But it definitely could be. If you somehow can trigger the Celebration ability every turn after you cast it the first time, it'll definitely be that good. Alright, next up we have Unassuming Sage, one colorless and white for a creature. It's a human peasant wizard. It's a 2-2, and when it enters the battlefield, you may pay two. If you do, create a sorcery roll token attached to it. Man, we're just putting kicker on cars without actually putting kicker on. Alright, that's another C for Unassuming Sage. Good dirt creature. You probably won't cut it from your deck most of the time, but even whenever you get to kick it, mm, not going to be that good. Oh, and it's only attached to it. Yeah, that's almost worse. No, yeah, it's attached to it. I lied. This is a D. Yeah. So I was thinking about another card for no real reason. All right, next up we have Virtue of Loyalty. Three colorless, white, white, for an enchantment. At the beginning of your end step, put a plus one, plus one counter on each creature you control. Untap those creatures. Man, that's already pretty good. But it gets even better, because it's also got an adventure. Ardenvale Fealty. Colorless and a white, for an instant, create a 2-2 two -two white knight creature token with vigilance. This card's an A+. It's probably the best white card overall. You would never cut it, never pass it, never, never, never. It's just so good. It is without a doubt the only virtue that isn't that ability isn't just completely silly. All it asks you to do is have creatures in your deck and on the battlefield, and the adventure part is also really good. A plus for virtue of loyalty. Alright, next up we've got Wear Fox Bodyguard, colorless and a white colorless white white for a creature elf fox knight. It's a 2-2, and it has Flash. When it enters the battlefield, exile up to one other target non-Fox creature until where Fox Bodyguard leaves the battlefield. Colorless and white, sacrifice where Fox Bodyguard, you gain two life. Uh, not 100% sure why you'd sacrifice it, but anything could happen. I think part of the joke is that since it's a Bodyguard, uh, the, the flavor of the card is trying to talk you into exiling something you own for some reason. And then sacrificing to get it back, but don't think you'll do that. Most of the time, you're just going to be casting a Flash Banisher Priest. A for Wear Fox Bodyguard. Alright, next up we have Heart Flame Duelist. One colorless and a white for a creature. It's a Human Knight. Instant and Sorcery spells you control have lifelink. It's a 3-1, and it's got an adventure. Heart Flame Slash, two colorless and a red for an instant. Heart Flame Slash deals three damage to any target. So, I think I was looking, and even just with uh, Kellen's Light Blades dealing damage, that's enough for this 2-mana 3-1 to be okay in your deck. And even if you're in white-green, the fight spells will all still also deal it, so you don't exactly have to be white and red to make it help, but I guess it... You don't exactly have to be white and red to get to put this card in your deck, but it definitely helps. If you can somehow cast the red part, it does become very good, and even without it, it's still fine enough. I'm going to give a low A grade to Heart Flame Duelist. All right, next up we have Pollen Shield Hair. It is colorless and a white. For a creature, it's a rabbit. It's got hair raising. Sorry. It's a creature that is a 2-2. Creature tokens you control get plus one, plus one. And it has hair raising, which is a sorcery adventure. Target creature you control gains vigilance and gets plus X, plus X, where X is the number of creatures you control. 
this card is a little bit less impressive. I think it's only, even if you do get to cast both halves, it's only going to act as about a B level card. And I think, I don't think you'd ever put it in your green deck just for the sorcery part. And so just as the white card, getting plus one, plus one to all your tokens, it will be pretty good, but it won't always be that good. All right, next up we have Shrouded Shepherd, colorless and a white for a creature. It's a spirit warrior. And it is a 2-2, two, two, and when it enters the battlefield, target creature you control gets plus 2, plus 2 until end of turn. Pretty good, it will help most things win their combat. But it's also got an adventure, Cleave Shadows. Colorless and a black for a sorcery. Creatures your opponents control get minus 1, minus 1 until end of turn. That is pretty good. We've got another B on our hands. Alright, next up when we have Woodland Acolyte. Two colorless and a white for a creature, human cleric. It, when it... It's a 2-2, and when it enters the battlefield, you draw a card. It's also got an adventure, Mend the Wilds. One green, for an instant, put target permanent card from your graveyard on top of your library. Uh, another B, really good card. I think, without a doubt, the white part, the number one reason to have it. I can't imagine any green deck just trying to play the uh, Mend the Wilds part. All right, next up, we've got the bonus sheet. And first up, we have Blind Obedience. One colorless and a white for an enchantment. It's as artifacts and creatures you control. Wait a minute. Artifacts and creatures your opponents control enter the battlefield tapped. It also has Extort, which is an old ability from Gate Crash. Whenever you cast a spell, you may play a white-black hybrid. If you do, each opponent loses one life, and you gain that much life. Um... You know, like, unless you're trying to stop your opponent from blocking or stop them from having haste, this ability might not be all that powerful in limited, and the extorting, I can believe, being a little bit awkward. I'm going to put this in D for right now, but maybe it'll get tried enough on me, and I'll change my tune. All right, next up, we have Dawn of Hope, which is colorless and a white for an enchantment. When you gain life, you may pay two if you do draw a card, and it has three colorless and a white. Create a 1-1 one, one white soldier token with lifelink. I think this card's an A. I think it's really good. It was really good in Guilds of Ravnica Limited whenever I would play it. And I think it's going to be pretty good here. Enabler and payoff. Alright, we have Grasp of Fate up next. Colus, white, white for an enchantment. When Grasp of Fate enters the battlefield for each opponent, exile up to one target non-land permanent. That player controls until Grasp of Fate leaves the battlefield. Yeah, this is also an A. It is just three mana, pretty much O-ring. Next up, we have Greater Oromancy. Call us in a white uh, for an enchantment. Other enchantments you control have Shroud. Enchanted creatures you control have Shroud. Um, oh, and a permanent with Shroud can't be the target of spells or abilities. That includes your own. This isn't Hexproof. Um, I think I'm just going to put it in B. There is a small possibility that uh, this isn't going to be quite enough. If they have, because of the relevance of the roll tokens, it is possible your opponents will be main decking a little bit more anti-enchantment hate than normal, and so just getting rid of this, it should be fairly simple. And so I don't think it's as slam of a dunk as it could be in some formats, but it is going to be very powerful most of the time. All right, next up we have Griffin Airy. It's got a colorless and a white, so it's an enchantment, and at the beginning of your end step, if you gain three or more life this turn, create a 2-2 white Griffin creature token with flying. Now here's the thing. I'm only going to put this card in D, and here's why. For some reason, in white, there is not actually a way to make a food. So you have to either be in black-white or black-green for this card to work even somewhat effectively, and even then, I don't think it's always going to, because it doesn't affect the affect the board itself whenever it comes online, and I don't know how many uh, foods you're actually going to get to just be getting these two twos, and it's only on the beginning of your end step, so we'll see it coming, all that jazz. Next up, we have Intangible Virtue, Colus and a White for an enchantment. Creature tokens you control get plus one, plus one, and have vigilance. So... Funny story, Intangible Virtue is the only block-constructed card that is banned in block-constructed. 
yeah, because it's banned in Innistrad Black Constructed because it would be just straight up the best card for whatever reason. Um, all that being said, actually looking through this set, a lot of the tokens you're going to play aren't that strong. Hear me out here. Like, you know, I've seen the rat tokens. We've seen the mouse tokens, one ones. You know, the knight tokens are two twos, but they already have vigilance, so this just makes them three threes. Uh, this not doing anything itself is somewhat a liability. It could be really strong on a splash in a super heavy all-in rats deck, but without that, I don't think it's going to be very impressive. Eh, we got a D on Intangible Virtue. Alright, next up we have Karmic Justice. Two colorless and a white for an enchantment. Whenever a spell or an ability an opponent controls, destroys a non to a non-creature permanent you control, you may destroy target permanent and opponent controls. Uh, I think this is a old card, and it's a commander card now, and everybody's going to be really happy to open it, but I don't think it's very good, because your opponent just isn't going to target your non-creature permanents with their removal spells. They just, like, won't do it. So you're never really going to get the ability off of this, I don't think. All right, next up we got Knightly Valor. Four colorless and a white for enchant creature when... It enters the battlefield, create a 2 2 white knight creature token with vigilance. Enchanted creature has plus 2, plus 2, and has vigilance. F. We don't put uh, 5 mana auras in our deck unless they pretty much win the game, and this certainly doesn't. Uh, next up, we have land tax. It's 1 white for an enchantment. At the beginning of your upkeep, if an opponent controls more land than you, you may search your library for up to 3 basic land cards, reveal them, put them into your hand, then shuffle. I am going to put this in the bottom of C. It could probably perform better. Uh, you know, in my mind, it does help you steal the playback when you're on the draw. Actually, because of that, explicitly, I do think this might only be a sideboard card. Because you would have to miss your land drop. If, if you don't just play it on turn one on the draw, because your opponent can't just not play their second land drop on turn two. It's not going to happen unless they're really trying to five-hit you. Um, so otherwise, you'll have to take a break, make sure they hit their next land drop, lose the advantage, and then play it. So I think this is 100% a sideboard card. It is a good sideboard card, with that being said. And whenever you do sideboard it in, it's going to really boost your win percentage. So C for land tax. All right, next up we have Leyline of Sanctity, two colorless and a white white for enchantment. If Leyline of Sanctity is in your opening hand, you may begin it with it on the battlefield. You have Hexproof. This card's pretty much an F. I could see you bringing it in out of your sideboard, but not often. Uh, this is not a very powerful ability. It's entirely a possible. It's entirely plausible that your opponent won't even have a card that'll target you. All right, next up we have Phyrexian Unlife. Two colorless and a white for an enchantment. You don't lose the game for having zero or less life. As long as you have zero or less life, all damage is dealt to you as though its source had infect. And that is damage dealt to you in the form of poison counters. This card's also an F. We're not going to pay three mana just to gain ten life. All right, next up we have Rest in Peace. Colorless and a white. When Rest in Peace enters the battlefield, exile all graveyards. If a card or token will be put into a graveyard from anywhere, exile instead. Another F, it's a cyborg card at best, and even still, I don't think it's going to do that much when you bring it in. And last but not least, we have Smothering Tithe, three colorless and a white for an enchantment. Whenever an opponent draws a card, that player may pay two. If that player doesn't, you create a treasure token. Um, this sure is four mana to not affect the board, and I absolutely hated having to resolve this ability whenever I was playing against it a few times in Ravnica Limited. Where's D? Yeah, I'm putting this in D just because I don't even like the card. And I don't think it's going to be that impressive. The only thing it has going for it is it's $20. And so in draft, you might pick it up to make sure you uh, stay in the money. Alright. That was white, everyone. I was afraid there for a minute. Uh, actually, you know what? And even still, I will just mention... None of the uh, regular cards I did put in F, only the bonus sheet. I do think that white actually might have a chance for being the best call in this format. You know, don't get after me with too many pitchforks. That and I think... Hmm. Yeah, and some of these Ds could probably be Cs. Now that I realize how few Cs I've got. 
What do I want to move? Mm, this. Um, no, those can stay. Yeah, I think I'll move this. I think it was actually a little bit hard on the mouse. If these I want to move down. I could see this being the best C, actually. Maybe break the spell. Nah, yeah, break the spell is the best C. Sorry, got to do that to make sure I feel like uh, the things are appropriately distributed. That way C's and B's have meaning. But uh, hopefully this still helps out. Hopefully you listen to everything I talked about with the cars. Because that's the uh, real value. And hopefully you learn something along the way about Limited. Good luck in all of your upcoming matches. I hope this helped. Please like this video. Leave a comment if you don't mind. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't. And make sure to catch the next series. We should have Blue coming up. And watch the whole series to get ready. Thank you so much for your time and goodbye. Oh wait, I didn't want you to see that.